Okay. Well, Frank, the first thing I'd like to ask you about is how you feel after two solid weeks every night at the Eurus <laughs> Theater. <laughs> I'm numb. <laughs> But uh, uh, it's a nice numbness, Bill. It's, uh, it's been a, uh, you know, with all of the engagements I've ever done in my lifetime and, and so many different kinds of places, this theater had a special effect on me because it was, uh, sound-wise, it was uh, perfect for me. Uh, the orchestra, as you know, you were in there several times, was sensational. The sound was good. But more than anything else, it was a love-in. Uh, uh, every night was a complete love-in with the people. And it was like coming home is what it was like. Being back in New yeah, York? Yeah, just like being back in New York, coming home again. There is something I've wondered about for a long time about you in, t in terms of that very statement, a love-in. To go around the world, to come out into a coliseum in any part of the world, to have it filled from ringside to the rafters with a wall of people, all of whom have come distances to see Frank Sinatra, all of whom love Frank Sinatra, the effect of this on you as a man, not as a performer, you know, just as a human being, can you, can you measure it in any way, Frank? Can you assess? No, that's tough. It's tough to measure. It's, uh, uh, it's, so, it's, it's so overwhelming that, 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 that there is that much affection yeah. in, a, in, a, uh, in an auditorium, let's say, uh, or a theater or wherever it might be. As you say, some of the places are, you know, wall to wall and, and seven stories high. Sometimes I look up, uh, for instance, uh, when I play, uh, let's say, Philadelphia or uh, Chicago or any of the places where they have the enormous arenas so that go straight up in the air, I look up and I don't quite believe that there are people I know. up way up there. Who can, I must look like about... Uh, I've been up little, there you know. years and years ago, <laughs> and you do. I have binoculars <laughs> to prove it. And Do you I ever feel like a gladiator coming out into the arena, almost as if... Oh, no, I'm scared. I'm not one of those gladiators. No, <laughs> no. no, 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 not at all. I, I took my mother to see uh, your show this past <laughs> Friday night, <laughs> and my mother was with you as a bobby soxer at the Paramount, and mm -hmm. she said, it used to take me four movies and juggling acts and all kinds of variety to get this close, because we were on the fifth row. And when it was all over, because my mother was really moved by your performance, I said, Take me back, Mother, to the Paramount and tell me what there was about Frank Sinatra then that captured people so much. And my mother said, because he sang with real emotion. And that leads me to a question. Mm -hmm. I believe that when you're, I believe as a person who has loved you and seen you perform many times, that these are, in fact, real emotions that are coming out yeah, of you. I think, I think they are. I think the, uh, uh, after I've chosen a piece of material uh, that I feel that I should be doing, uh, particularly something in a serious vein, you know, a ballad of some type, or a slightly dramatic thing like a, a Send in the Clowns, I think it has to do uh, with uh, something in your background that, that comes forth, it comes, it comes forward, and it presents itself, and uh, rather than just reading a piece of poetry, as would be the case if it were a poem with someone else, uh, McCune or one of the guys like that, I, as a singer, have to do it in that sense. So I tried to uh, transpose my thoughts about the song into a person who might, at that moment, be saying that to somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know, I know precisely. He's, he's making his case, in other words, yeah. for himself. And I think that, uh, uh, I don't know where it started. I have no idea where it started I mean, in my life. But I think that I've worked, I've worked in that vein always, all the way back with Tommy and before Tommy, when I was a kid just kind of, you know, working from one small joint to another. I, I have to ask you, because I've wondered, and I've never read, and I've never had any insight into it, about you as a kid. Mm. Your father said to you, get out of the house. Mm. Now, you t you mentioned that practically every night at the Eurus, right. in, a, in a loving way and yeah. also in a funny way, because yeah. you sounded like Archie Bunker right. when you said That's it. That's true. Uh, how, how did you feel, Frank? Literally, your father saying, get out of the house. I was you. shocked. I was absolutely <laughs> shocked. I didn't know where the hell to go. Do you remember the moment? Do you remember the... I remember the moment. We were, we were having breakfast, and uh, I was supposed to have been got, I'd gotten up that morning to go out and look for a job, because I decided that I didn't want to go to college. And uh, he wanted me to go to college in the worst way. He was a man, as you heard me say, could never read nor write his name. And his big point was education, yeah. complete and full education. And I had planned to go to Stevens Institute, which is 
uh, in Hoboken, you know, and it's, one, it's considered one of the finest engineering schools in the world. And I was going to be a civil engineer, as a matter of fact. I had great desires to be one until I, uh, till I got, you know, mixed up in, in vocalizing, but not to go ahead for a minute. Uh, he, um, he got a little bit fed up with me because I, I, uh, I just wasn't going out looking for work. But at night, I was working with little combinations, you know, singing with the bands for nothing so I could get the experience. And uh, with a megaphone, you wouldn't know what that is. It's Rudy Valley. Rudy yeah. Valley. That's what you sing. You for. actually used a megaphone? I had a me and guys would throw pennies in to try to, try to see if they could get me to swallow the pennies, that. you know. <laughs> a lot of fun those days. <laughs> try it with shot glasses. But now. I used to move a great deal. Like this, <laughs> so they couldn't hit it. But it was great fun. And, um, and he, at this particular morning, said to me, uh, uh, why don't you just get out of the house and go out on your own? Is really what he said, you know, get out. And uh, I think the egg was stuck in here for about <laughs> 20 minutes. I couldn't swallow it or get rid of it anyway. My mother, of course, was nearly in tears. And, uh, uh, but, but we agreed that it might be a good thing. And then I packed up a small case that I had, and I came to New York. Do you, did you project things for yourself? That, I guess that's another thing that I think a lot of people have wondered. If any individual achieves a measure of success in life, as you have. Was there a point along the line when you saw what might happen as a potential thing, or was it just a natural flow from point to point? No, only once in my life I saw something that might happen, or I had tried to, to plan it, and that was to get to sing as a vocalist with the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. Because you that, had that as an objective? That was an objective. I wanted to do that in the worst way, because I thought after watching uh, all of the other orchestras who were equally as marvelous. In those days, uh, one band was as good as the other, you know. They were, they were different styles. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they, had, uh, they had fine singers with all the bands. They had the, the Eberlees, and Jack Leonard was with the Tommy at, in those days. And, um, um, but I used to go and watch, uh, uh, I'd go, for instance, if they did a one-nighter at Roseland, I would buy a ticket, go in and sit, stand at the front of the bandstand, and watch the band, and watch how he handled the singers. And they were handled with such finesse, and, they, and, and, and showcased, in other words. It wasn't a matter of an in introduction, vocal chorus, orchestra, and out. He would set a singer up so that the singer would sing the first chorus, the orchestra would play a small piece of music, a turnaround, and the singer would finish it. In other words, he was featured. And I thought, and also Tommy had he had such, uh, he had a uh, 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 simpatico about vocaling, vocalizing. Uh, I didn't know that at the time, but I found out later that he did, because the instrument that he played, the trombone, had the same physical qualities that, uh, that, that the, the human voice has in a way of, of, uh, of uh, execution, like a flute player would have. And, uh, and not as much, for instance, as a trumpet player or a saxophone. There's something quite soft about a trombone when it's played well, it's like cello. And um, I found out later, after I'd been with the orchestra for a while, and he also found out that I had been trying to uh, find what his secret was about his playing 10 measures. His without, breath control. Yeah, his yeah. breath control. And uh, after I was with him for a year, he said one night at, uh, I don't know, at Carnegie Tech, some college date we were doing, uh, I used to watch his, his, uh, his back, his jacket, to see if he, when he would breathe. But I would never see the jacket move, and I thought, He's got to be breathing someplace because <laughs> through his I ears, maybe through the ears, <laughs> or someplace. And I used to kind of lean around and just peek and see if I could. But you see, he, in holding the instrument, he had he covered his mouth, and 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 then covered the rest of his face with his hand with a slide, and he put the horn down at this particular night. And he said to he walked over to me and he said, "Haven't you seen it yet?" He knew that I had been watching him for about trying a year, to figure trying it out. to figure it out. And I was working on it in my own way by just doing physical exercises, breathing exercises, and things like that. And uh, uh, for instance, I'd go, with, if, ever, if there was a chance we'd go swimming someplace, uh, uh, the, the guys would say to me, don't you ever swim on top of the water? I read that yeah, once. I read that you actually it's swim true. underwater. I used to swim, and I still do. I yeah. swim mostly underwater to, to, to keep the bellows as strong as you can. And he said to me, haven't you found out yet? And I said, I don't, I don't understand it yet. I don't quite get it. And he showed me that he had a, a pinhole that he used in the corner of his mouth that he could catch a, a catch breath. And by doing that, he could go an additional two measures that made it seem like he played, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 to 12 bars without breathing. Yeah. 
which was exciting to hear. It was really, it would keep, to keep you flow, breathless yeah. as, a, as a viewer. It would keep you breathless. It kept me breathless when I watched him.